Hey everyone, my name is Max Fields. I'm one of the organizers of tonight's event. Uh, thanks for coming out um, for tonight's lecture with Jana Hunter. Uh, the program tonight is presented in conjunction with 20 Hertz, which is CAM's uh, music-based lecture series. Uh, the series uh, brings creative minds from diverse disciplines to talk about the music that inspires their lives. So previously, if you've come to any one of our 20 Hertz events, uh, you might be familiar that we bring in artists, other musicians, uh, curators, creatives, period. Um, but for those who don't know, Jana Hunter began her career as a musician in Arlington, Texas before moving to Houston, where she refined her solo music career and collaborative project, uh, Maddie and Mossy. Later, Hunter continued to develop her music in Baltimore, where she formed the critically acclaimed band Lower Dens. Their album, Escape from Evil, has been described as a vivid world of queer retrofuturism, uh, a wide open space that offers access to the emotionally, uh, emotionality of the recent past without subscribing to its violence. She's recognized by the global music community as an innovator and influential voice, inspiring artists and musicians with her unique experiments in writing, performing, and artistic presentation. But before we begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to thank Jana Hunter and her band, Lower Dens, for agreeing to visit Houston and put on two incredible events. Uh, Maria at Oblique Management, Nate and everyone uh, who helped out at the Windish Agency, Hunter Brown, uh, uh, David Garcia at LCD Systems, and all of my colleagues at the museum who have worked tirelessly to craft these two very special events. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jana Hunter for tonight's event. Hi, everybody. I, uh, I haven't gotten up and spoken in front of people without a guitar in front of me for a long time, so uh, forgive me for all the many mistakes I'm going to make. Um, so I wanted to talk about politics in music and, um, and well, let me, let me just start by saying that I was I was uh, actually pretty surprised that the CAM would offer me a lecture. I didn't uh, go to college. I am not an expert of any sort. Um, the only reason that I could think of that they asked me to do this is that I've been uh, increasingly offering my views about things. Um, having had a couple of opportunities recently to talk about things that are very important to me, like gender fluidity and racial discrimination, I knew more or less immediately that if I were to accept this opportunity, I'd have to make it about this. I realized a few years ago that if I was gonna keep doing music in any sort of public way, I'd have to take advantage of the platform. Um, when I was younger, I really avoided politics. I went through periods of general fatalism regarding our planet and species, disappointment in the politically fervent people around me, <laughs> and Hard personal times, I avoided politics because I could, and it made things a little easier when they already seemed so hard. I had strong political beliefs always, but I didn't pay attention to what was happening in the country or the world or any, on any kind of grand scale. It seemed too difficult or maybe even pointless. The world was beyond changing and I couldn't even pay my bills. Why bother or how uh, with anything else? Um, yeah, so for a long time, I just wrote about personal things because I needed a way to process them. And I, it wasn't that I felt like I couldn't be bothered paying attention to politics. It was just that I didn't have kind of the room left over in my, uh, in my self for other things because life was difficult. Um, but as I got older and I started to work through stuff, uh, stuff of my own, and my life started to stabilize a little bit more, uh, it, became really, it became really clear to me that if I was going to be a musician, being a musician I think is important. I think it offers people something in and of itself, but I think also the way that we've kind of made musicians into celebrities, that we've made celebrity culture out of music industry, it, I don't know, it almost seems to demand to me that 
musicians make a point of espousing political views, and they used to in this country, and they don't as much anymore. So I wanted to talk about some of the reasons why. Um, the kind of one of the first uh, groups that I came across in research for this was the the Wobblies. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the with the Wobblies, <laughs> the International Workers uh, Party. This is back in the like the beginning of the 20th century, and they had a songwriter named Joe Hill, uh, Swedish-born immigrant worker, frequently facing unemployment and underemployment, became a popular songwriter and cartoonist for the Radical Union. Wrote lyrics to wrote new lyrics for Christian hymns that articulated the frustrations, hostilities, and humor of the homeless and dispossessed, including the song called uh, "The Preacher and the Slave." Basically, the uh, people trying to shut down the meetings would come out and play music uh, via the Salvation Army band really loudly, so that these people couldn't meet. And so he wrote new lyrics so that they could sing along to the bands as they played. And this one is like specifically making fun of the band. All right, I think you get the idea, basically. The song is called The Preacher and the Slave, a.k.a. Uh, there'll be pie in the sky when you die, that's a lie. Uh, basically, the idea that the, uh, the Salvation Army was paid by uh, management types to tell people that they were working for their, you know, the, the payoff in heaven instead of, like, a paycheck on earth. Um, that they would eat when they died. Um, and, and so that was, I mean, that's, I'm sure that there are examples of political music prior to that in our country, but that's kind of the first in what seems like a tradition to me um, of a, an alternate kind of like radicalized culture that's existed for us for a long time, but that is uh, covered up in a lot of ways. That's like intentionally written out of textbook history that most of us don't know about. Or maybe all of you know about it. I don't know. No? Shaking your heads? No. Well, it happened. It all happened. Um, another thing that happened was there was a uh, group called the Popular Front. This was an allegiance of political parties aimed at resisting fascism. This was something that started in Europe, but it also spread to the United States. Uh, it happened in the 30s and 40s. Uh, in the US, it was a movement to create political coalitions of anti-fascist groups, including the Communist Party, and included musical acts like the Almanac Singers and Yip Harburg. A, uh, it was a vigorously democratic and multiracial movement in the arts and daily life that was sponsored but not controlled by the Communist Party. One thing that's kind of amazing is you start doing research on this and, and it's, it's amazing how popular communism and socialism were. Uh, they were much bigger and more influential than you think of them. And that's one of the things that I mean, that, that it's been like written out of our culture. We just don't know our own history anymore. Um, one example that there was a, a guy named Abel Mirapol, and he wrote the song that Billie Holiday is most famous for, the song Strange Fruit. Uh, he and his wife, Anne, also adopted the sons of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were famously killed by the government for spying. So this is one of the first songs uh, kind of written and performed directly by black artists about racial discrimination, especially one that kind of reached these levels of fame. Right around the same time, uh, 
we started to see people reacting, like people who were kind of in the tradition of the Popular Front coming out, like Woody Guthrie is the most famous example. Woody Guthrie, uh, hopefully you already know about Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie uh, performed uh, with a sticker that he made on his guitar that said, this machine kills fascists. He wrote hundreds of songs, particularly during the Depression, and was associated with and a supporter of socialism and the Communist Party. He was a major influence on music in the United States, notably the major influence on young Bob Dylan. And he wrote a song called This Land Is Your Land, uh, which was written in reaction to God Bless America, which he found unrealistic and complacent. He was a... Uh, uh, a lot of these people were patriots and they felt like their land was being ruined by people that were uh, kind of, you know, pr pretenders, people who were pretending like they gave a shit about the people and about the country, but instead were working for themselves. Um, when any measure of fame is acquired, an artist has the ability to deliver a message. There's a choice there. You work for the self or you work for the truth. And it'll come as no surprise to any of you as this is a decision every human faces that as a musician, putting a priority on number one is easier. Uh, it's so much easier that the choice to serve the self is almost reflexive. It is reflexive, it's instinctive. It's hard to blame anybody for following instincts and yet in most cases we do, because we should. Because that choice is the lesser choice. Working solely for the self ignores a critical truth of existence. We are, whether or not we acknowledge it, part of a community. Uh, if the community as a whole suffers, the individual suffers. As if the community as a whole benefits, so does the individual. In many cases, we hold each other to a standard of working for the truth instead of working for the self, and I believe it's important to hold musicians to that same standard. Um, Somebody else, uh, another group around the same time were the Almanac Singers. They eventually became the Weavers and they included young Pete Seeger. Uh, the Almanac Singers formed in 1940 and broke up in 1943 uh, because they were uh, too progressive for the time. Um, and so when they formed the Weavers, they decided to be less uh, political, less obviously political. Um, but they had already, unfortunately, signed up as members of the Communist Party. So when the House on american Activities Committee uh, started calling people to testify, they were called to testify, they were blacklisted in the industry, they were surveilled by the FBI, they had their contract terminated by DECA, who also deleted their records from its catalog, they had their songs denied airplay, performances protested and heckled by anti-communist groups. They disbanded in 1952 and wouldn't reunite for several years, even though they'd make a, made a conscious decision to go for money instead of politics, they still got screwed because they, they used to have political beliefs. And to me, that's not, a, that's not an indicator that you should that they never should have had political beliefs in the first place is that they never should have they never should have abandoned them. I mean, if you're going if you're going to if you're gonna get arrested, you might as well get arrested for saying something that you believe in that you're gonna stand up for. To me, that they're just like now they're you know they're at that point they're just cowards. Um, and I don't think I'm making my point very clearly, but maybe you get it. Um, <laughs> uh, being a musician, being any kind of person on any kind of stage gives one a rare opportunity outside of any necessi necessarily religious or spiritual context. You're able to see exactly how much separation there is between your real self and your projected self-image, your body and your image can become a puppet. You can discard all the useless baggage you've acquired and present a narrow version of the self-image. The beauty of this possibility is that it allows the artist to create a more defined narrative. When fans and audience members interact with celebrity on any scale, they are, knowingly or not, interacting with a character. The better of an artist you are, the more clear and concise the narrative of this character becomes. Uh, when I was writing that, I was mostly thinking about Harry Belafonte, 
um, who was just maybe the coolest person alive, um, and in his day, maybe the sexiest, uh, too. Uh, I got to see, there was, this, there's a, there was a documentary that came out about Harry Belafonte a few years ago, and I've been told by friends that it's not very good, but I <clears throat> remember it as being very good because Harry Belafonte was there presenting, presenting it, and so it seemed like the most amazing movie in the world. But uh, he, he just was kind of like literally the pioneer of cool. He was, you know, he was singing uh, traditional songs, but, the, they, but they, their meaning was really lost uh, on our culture. But then at the same time that he was doing that, he was, uh, he was a huge supporter of the civil rights movement, both in his actions and with his money. He supported Martin Luther King's family financially, uh, and he's done, th he's done stuff ever since. He, uh, he helped organize We Are the World, he performed in Live Aid, he was appointed as a goodwill ambassador by UNICEF, he has at various times made statements opposing the U.S. embargo on Cuba, praising Soviet peace initiatives, attacking the U.S. invasion of Granada, praising the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, honoring Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, and praising Fidel Castro. He's additionally known for his views to Cuba where he helped ensure hip hop's place in Cuban society. That story is really amazing, you should look it up. He basically like met with Fidel Castro and was like, these uh, hip hop guys in your country are really cool and then Fidel Castro gave them a studio. <laughs> um, Harry Belafonte was mentored by a guy named Paul Robeson who was a strong supporter of anti-colonialism in Africa, of the Republicans and the Spanish Civil War of socialism in the United States and was brought before the House on American Activities Committee in 1956. Uh, he didn't go on to participate as actively as others in the civil rights movement due to failing health and uh, his refusal to, he was uh, excluded from some, by some of the movement's leaders based on his refusal to denounce pro-communist views um, which he said, in response to that, he said, the artist must take sides, he must elect to fight for freedom or slavery. I've made my choice, I had no alternative. Uh, after an appearance in Tales of Manhattan, a production that he felt was very offensive to his people, he announced that he would no longer act in films because of the demeaning roles available to blacks. Refused to perform in the American South. Oh no, sorry, I'm talking about Harry Belafonte again. Um, Paul Robeson, I want to show you a, a little clip of him speaking. You probably recognize him uh, from old movies and you would definitely recognize his voice if he was singing. Anyway, here he is. So yeah, Paul Robeson is really something else. Uh, and he is part of a tradition that would, uh, you know, that would continue into the 50s and 60s. Uh, there's so much here that I have written down that I definitely don't have time. I'll keep you here for hours, but uh, uh, there is We Shall Overcome, which they don't even know when the original versions of it were written. It's based on two separate gospel hymns. It's adapted in 1948 by a woman named Zilphia Horton. Uh, it's an amazing name. Along with many other songs for use in the civil rights movement via the publication People's Songs Bulletin, an organization founded by Pete Seeger, Alan Lomax, Lee Hayes, and others on December 31st, 1945 in New York to create, promote, and distribute songs of labor in the American people. It was recorded, recorded and performed by many different people throughout the original civil rights movement, including Pete Seeger and Joan Baez, uh, Nina Simone. Um, really hits her stride right around this time. Uh, she writes Mississippi Goddamn in 1964 in response to the murder of Medgar Evers and the bombing of the church in Birmingham that killed four black children. 
From then on, a civil rights message was standard in her recording repertoire, becoming a part of her live performances. She performed and spoke at many civil rights meetings, such as the Selma to Montgomery marches. She advocated violent revolution during the civil rights period rather than MLK's nonviolent approach, and she hoped that African Americans could, by armed combat, form a separate state. Uh, nevertheless, she wrote in her autobiography that she and her family regarded all races as equal. I feel like somebody just added that in in Wikipedia to make it sound better. Um, I just don't think there's anything wrong with the way that she felt. Uh, for women, she wrote in 1965, Young, Gifted, and Black. She performed in 1969. Uh, I want to show you Mississippi Goddamn, but really you should just go watch that documentary that was just uh, put out about her. It's very good. Um, when this cultural and sociopolitical environment is ready for change, as we are now in our time, it's up to the artist to reflect the desires of the people um, and not to cower in the face of things like capitalism and its advocates. And I just want to take a moment to say I, I, don't, uh, I don't mean to espouse any particular political view, and I know it, pro it might seem that way, but uh, what I believe really is not that my beliefs are important, but just that having beliefs that are that are beliefs and that aren't like strident ideologies is important. I believe that these communications are important. I believe that it's important for artists to talk about these things, but I don't think that me talking about it means that I think that you need to believe what I believe. I don't believe that. Um, it doesn't matter merely what you say or do, but what you think and what the intentions behind your actions are. We all know of those in our lives, maybe even ourselves, who say things that sound like they're meant to advance causes of good and truth, but are doing so in order to advance their own image and well-being. Uh, fortunately, most of us are smart enough to see through thinly disguised bullshit if we look even minimally further into the context in which a message is delivered. Um, so I wanted to talk for a second about Bob Dylan, um, not to dwell on him, but you know, but in the 1960s, early 1960s, he's writing songs like Masters of War, um, a criticism of American leaders and, official, and officials and the military, uh, military industrial complex during the Cold War nuclear armament. Uh, he says in liner notes later, I've never really written anything like that before. I don't sing songs which hope people will die, but I couldn't help it with this one. This song is a sort of striking out, a reaction to, a reaction to the last straw, a feeling of what can you do. And then in Bob Dylan, uh, two years later, denounced being part of a movement and most of his songs became nuts. Uh, they, weren't, they didn't lack substance, but they became markedly less political with a few notable exceptions. And who knows exactly why, I mean, I'm sure he explains a lot of times why he's done that, but it's a, it's a, it's possibly a move towards um, protecting himself, and who can really blame him for that? Um, there's another guy named Phil Ox around the same time, Phil Oaks, sorry. He wrote a song called Power and the Glory. It's also a patriotic song. He's a very much a patriot. Um, he lauds America and the American dream. And there was a, a fourth verse, apparently, that was unrecorded. It was, uh, yet our land is still troubled by men who have to hate. They twist away our freedom and they twist away our fate. Fear is their weapon and treason is their cry. We can stop them if we try. Interestingly left off of the recording. Um, in the 70s, or just following 1968, basically the country changes really drastically. Phil Ox is one of the best. Phil Ox is one of the best examples of the unraveling of American political artistry following the events of 1968. He became increasingly depressed and paranoid, and despite a few years spent traveling abroad in a very successful concert celebrating the end of the Vietnam War, he committed suicide in 1976. Um, in the 70s, after the assassinations of, uh, of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., the riots that followed King's assassination in many major cities in America and the 1968 election of Richard Nixon, 
political music or political actions by musicians were abandoned by everybody but the most resilient believers in a way our nation and so too our artists have never really recovered to this day. Those things are embraced by those who feel they have little left to lose while those who have money or power to protect cover up political affiliations or espouse only those that ensure capital gains. So you start to see uh, punk and hip hop people like representations again of uh, working classes and minorities, people who feel like they have nothing left to lose and their messages this time are different. Uh, there's the crass song, Do They Owe Us a Living? Of course they do. Uh, the X song, Weapons for El Salvador. They cannot just sit and talk, they need a revolution. Shortly thereafter, punk is followed by Riot Girl which goes on to influence many musicians today, including uh, Pussy Riot, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and then you also have political hip hop. Uh, right around the same time, by the 70s, hip hop was already a well-developed cultural movement and was also almost from its inception an avenue for MCs to express socio-political beliefs. Uh, one of the best and most enduring Examples of that is up here somewhere. I really want to watch the whole thing, but we can't. Uh, no, we can't. Um, so I realize that it's getting fairly late. I'm going to redo some things. Um, but let me know if you're getting restless. Uh, politics are a fearsome topic in today's music industry. This is kind of continuing what I was talking about. Um, earlier uh, about uh, musicians espousing only the political affiliations that ensure capital gains. Uh, politics are a fearsome topic in today's music industry, the way our economic market works. It's much better for your wallet if you can ride some kind of safe, neutral line all the way to the bank. In my opinion, this is capitalism's offensive tactics aligning neatly with a frightened individual's defensive tactics. If you're afraid that other humans are out to get you, capitalism provides a false sense of security that will cost you and never stops bilking you. It works, but at the cost of feeling any sort of belonging to your species. To, the, to protect this uh, sacred cycle, we push dissenters and protesters out of earshot and eyesight. Uh, and this includes chart toppers who espouse political opinions like Dixie Chicks and Lauren Hill. Uh, I mean, pretty much anybody you see, if they say something really pointed that's not agreed with, they lose their careers. Um, A way in which this appears to manifest is that there are political songs that have become less pointed and more vague as if even the musicians who are uh, at once popular and political no longer feel unafraid and express themselves plainly. But you can't write a safe, dispassionate, effective political song. Um, I want to show you one more thing, and then watch this whole thing. And one thing, I can't remember if I really specifically talked about this, but one thing I was thinking about with Harry Belafonte is that he's somebody who, I mean, there's different ways to be political as a musician. There's writing political songs, and then there's writing songs that maybe aren't so political, but acting politically. He's a really good example of that. And I think because musicians today are more worried about making a living and losing their careers, that they tend to kind of be quietly political 
in both ways sometimes. Right. <clears throat> Whether or not anyone is an agent of establishment or capitalism or whatever is up to the individual. You alone know your intentions. If you act to protect yourself and your belongings, you are an agent. If you work to protect those who are less advantaged than you, you are an agent of truth and the greater good. We can't let the people who are under the biggest threat from the establishment stand alone. They look at us, the establishment, and at the very least they see a lesser threat. Sometimes we're so innocuous that they don't even see us. That's privilege, and privilege is power. And it's time for us to recognize that we have privilege because we're not the most oppressed, because we're not the most poor, and because we have microphones in front of us. And when I say that, I'm, you know, I think about addressing musicians, but it's also just the way music and the music industry is like just the lens for me through which I see all other things. So when I say that to musicians, I'm not just saying it to musicians, but they're the only people that I feel qualified to like make demands of. Um, I want to read you something that uh, uh, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates went off on uh, this past week on Twitter. He said, when I was reading this weekend, someone handed me an anthology of Jan Pataka's stuff. Uh, this part is not that important, but it just leads into the next. Instructed me to take a hard look at Charter 77. I don't know much about Pataka, know a little about Havel, but there's a lot of stuff in there on the principle of process over goals. I'm mangling, but basically they argue that whether you pin your need to struggle on, that when you pin your need to struggle on we shall win, you've not fully committed idea is that the principle of resistance is correct no matter the outcome. Win or lose, live or die, hope or hopeless, correct to resist no matter. Optimism, pessimism, irrelevant. Your charge is to resist, period. Um, had me thinking of stuff I felt with, he just came out with a new book. How does one resist outside a Christian framework? Like, what if we do not overcome? What if you have no belief system that argues for the meek inheriting the earth? What if you don't actually believe that God really is just and will take your side? What then? Is that the end of morality? I don't think it is. I suspect process is underrated. The value of the fight itself is underrated. Anyway, I don't have this fully spelled out yet, but I hate the idea of resistance slash writing slash fighting as a Vince Lombardi quote. I think there's something to be gained by looking into the darkness. Like, you should look at things at their most bleak. I don't think despair is on the other side. I think there's something gorgeous. Uh, I, I think he's right. This is, he's kind of hitting on something that I think about all the time. I think that we're pulled I really do think that, uh, you know, people say that there are two kinds of people all the time, but I do believe that there's, in one way, that's true, and I think that there are people who work uh, for themselves because they're scared, and then I think there are people who work um, for the truth, and I think that's because we don't want to be alone, and I think that's a good enough reason, is that it's, it's lonely without other people, and, and doing things for the greater good makes you feel less less alone. I think that that's really important. And I think that musicians need to talk about those sorts of things. Anyway, that's all I got. Thanks very much. Um, thanks.